LibriVox.org. Recording by James K. White. Amadis of Gol by Bajgo de Lobera. Translated by Robert Southey. Book Two. Chapter Six. How Don Galaor and Florestan and the Grayes went in quest of Amadis, and how Amadis, forsaking his arms and changing his name, betook himself to a solitary life with a good man in a hermitage. Isanjo, according to his promise, revealed nothing concerning Amadis till after Mass the next day. Then, when his brethren and his cousin inquired for him, he said, Arm yourselves, and I will tell you his commands. And, when they were armed, Isanjo began to weep passionately, and exclaimed, O oh, sirs, what a grief and a misery is come upon us, that we should lose our lord so soon! Then he told them all that Amadis had said, and how he besought that they would not seek him, for they could not help his ill, and that they should not grieve for his death. Holy Mary, cried they, the best knight in the world is about to perish. But we seek him, and, if we cannot with our lives help him, we will bear him company with our deaths. Isanjo then told Galaor his brother's request, that he would make Gandalin a knight, and take the dwarf into his service. This he delivered weeping, and they weeping also heard it. The dwarf, for pure grief, was beating his head against a wall, but Galaor caught him up and said, Adrian, come with me, since thy master has so commanded, and my lot shall be yours. The dwarf answered, Sir, I will follow you, but not as my master till we know some certain tidings of Amadis. Forthwith they went to horse, and all three hastened along the road, which Isanjo pointed. All day they rode on, meeting no one of whom they could ask tidings, till they came where El Patin lay wounded beside his dead horse. His squires had found him, and were cutting down boughs and poles to make him a litter for he was exceeding faint with loss of blood, so that he could not answer them, but made sign that they should speak to his squires, and they replied that their lord had sped so ill in an encounter with the knight who had won the firm island. Good squires, know you which way he went? No. But before we came up to this place, we met an armed knight in the forest, upon a stout horse, and he was weeping and accusing his fortune. A squire behind him carried his arms. The shield had two lions azure in a field oar, and the squire was lamenting also. "'That is he!' cried they, and they pushed on with great speed till they came out of the forest upon a great plain, where there were many roads in every direction, so that they knew not which way to take." Therefore they agreed to separate, and meet at the court of Lisuarte upon St. John's Day, that if by then they had been unsuccessful in their search, they might consult anew how to find him. There, then, they embraced and separated, each earnestly bent on his quest, but in vain, for when Amadis reached the open country, he took none of those roads, but struck aside along a glen, and thence made into the mountain. He rode on lost in thought, suffering his horse to choose the path. About noon the horse came to some trees that grew beside a mountain stream, and then stopped, being weary of the heat and with the toil of last night. Here Amadis recollected himself, and looked around, and was pleased to see no signs of a habitation. He alighted and drank of the brook. Gandalin came up, and, turning the horses to feed, came to his master, whom he found more dead than alive. And not daring to disturb him, he lay down before him. Amadis continued in this mood till sunset. Then, rising, he struck his foot against Gandalin. "'Art thou sleeping?' quoth he. 
no replied gandalin but i am thinking upon two things which concern you the which if it please you to hear i will speak if not i will be silent amadis answered go saddle the horses and let us be gone i do not choose to be found by those who seek me sir said gandalin you are in a solitary place and your horse is so weary that unless you allow him some rest he cannot carry you amadis replied weeping do what you think best whether i stay or go there is no rest for me then gandalin looked after the horses and returned to his master and begged him to eat of a pasty which he had brought but he would not sir said he shall i say the two things whereon i have been thinking say what you will quoth amadis i care nothing now for anything that may be said or done and wish to live no longer than till i can confess then i pray you hear me sir i have thought much upon that letter which oriana sent you and upon the words of the knight with whom you fought and seeing how light is the faith of many women it may be that she hath changed her affections and so has feigned anger against you before you discover it the other thing is that i believe her to be so good and loyal that she could not have been thus moved unless some great falsehood had been spoken of you which she believes and feels in her heart and since you know that you have never been false you should make the truth known, whereby she will repent of what she hath done, and entreat your forgiveness for the wrong, and you will enjoy your former happiness. It is better to take food with this hope than by abandoning yourself to despair, to die and lose her, and the glory of this world, and even the other. Hold thy peace, for God's sake, quoth Amadis, for such foolishness and lies as thou hast uttered are enough to provoke the whole world. Oriana, my lady, has never done wrong, and if I perish, it is but reasonable, not for my deserving, but to accomplish her will and command. If I did not know that thou hast said this to comfort me, I would cut off thy head. You have greatly displeased me. Never say the like to me again. He then turned away in anger, and walked along the side of the stream. But Gandalin, who for two days and a night had not slept, was overcome with heaviness, and at length fell asleep. When Amadis saw this, he saddled his horse, and hid Gandalin's saddle and bridle among the bushes, that he might not be able to find them. And, taking his arms, he struck into the wildest part of the mountain. All night he went, and the next day till vespers. Then he came to a plain at the foot of a mountain. There were two high trees there that grew over a fountain, and there he went to give his horse drink, for they had found no water all that day. When he came up to the fountain, he saw an old man in a religious habit who was giving his ass water. His beard and hair were gray, and his habit was very poor being made of goat's hair. Amadis saluted him, and asked him if he was a priest. The good man answered that he had been one forty years. God be praised, quoth Amadis. I beseech you, for the love of God, stay here to-night, and hear my confession, of which I am in great need. In God's name, said the old man. Then Amadis alighted, laid his arms upon the ground, and took the saddle from his horse, and let him feed. And he disarmed, and knelt before the good man, and began to kiss his feet. The good man took him by the hand, and raised him, and made him sit by him. And beholding him well, he thought him the goodliest knight that ever he saw. But he was pale, and his face and neck were stained with tears, so that the old man had great pity, and said, Sir Knight, it seems that you are in great affliction. If it be for any sin that you have committed, and these tears spring from repentance, in a happy hour came you here. 
but if it be for any worldly concerns from which by your youth and comeliness it seems you cannot be removed, remember God and beseech him of his mercy to bring you to his service. He then raised his hand and blessed him, and bade him relate all the sins he could call to mind. Hereon Amadis began the whole discourse of his life without letting anything pass. The good man then said, Seeing that you are of such understanding, and of so high a lineage, you ought not to despair and cast yourself away for anything that may befall you, much less for the action of a woman, for they are as easily won as lightly lost. I counsel you to lay aside such folly, for the love of God, to whom it is displeasing, and even for worldly reason, for man ought not to love where he is not beloved." Good sir, replied Amadis, I am now in such extremity that I cannot live any long time. I beseech you, by that God whose faith you hold, take me with you for the little while I have to live, that I may have comfort for my soul. My horse and arms I need no longer. I will leave them here and go with you on foot, and perform whatever penitence you enjoin. If you refuse, you will sin before God, for else I shall wander and perish in this mountain. When the good man saw him thus resolute, he said to him, with a heart wholly bent to his good, Certes, sir, it becomes not a knight like you to abandon himself as if he had lost the whole world by reason of a woman. Their love is no longer than while they see you with their eyes, and hear such words as you say to them, and that past, presently they forget you, especially in those false loves that are begun against the Lord. The same sin which makes them sweet at first gives them a bitterness in the end, as you experience. But you who are of such prowess and have such power— you, who are the true and loyal protector of such as are oppressed, great wrong would it be to the world if you thus forsake it. I know not what she is who hath brought you to this extremity, but if all the worth and beauty of the sex were brought together in one, I know that such a man as you ought not to be lost for her. Good sir, quoth Amadis, I ask not your counsel upon this, where it is not wanted. But for my soul's sake, I pray you, take me in your company, for else I shall have no remedy but to die in this mountain. The old man, hearing this, had such compassion on him that the tears fell down his long white beard. Sir, my son, said he, I live in a dreary place and a hard life. My hermitage is full seven leagues out at sea, upon a high rock, to which no ship can come, except in summer time. I have lived there these thirty years, and he who lives there must renounce all the pleasures and delights of the world, and all my support is the alms which the people of the land here bestow upon me. I promise you, said Amadis, this is the life I desire for the little while I shall live, and I beseech you, for the love of God, let me go with you. The good man, albeit against his will, consented, and Amadis said, Now, father, command me what to do, and I will be obedient. The good man gave him his blessing, and said vespers, and then, taking bread and fish from his wallet, he bade Amadis eat. But Amadis refused, though he had been three days without tasting food. You are to obey me, said the good man, and I command you to eat, else your soul will be in great danger if you die. Then he took a little food, and when it was time to sleep, the old man spread his cloak and laid him down thereon, and Amadis laid himself down at his feet. The most part of the night Amadis did nothing but turn from side to side, but at last being sore wearied, he fell asleep and in that sleep he dreamt that he was fastened in a dark chamber where there was no light at all. Neither could he find any way to come out thereof, whereat he greatly lamented. 
Then he thought that his cousin Mabilia and the damsel of Denmark came to him, and there was a sunbeam before them which dispelled the darkness, and they took him by the hand, saying, Come forth, sir, to this great palace. And he thought that he was right joyful, and going out he saw his lady Oriana surrounded with a great flame of fire, whereat he cried out, Holy Mary, help her, and ran through the fire to save her, feeling no hurt, and took her in his arms and carried her into a garden, the greenest and pleasantest that ever he had seen. At the loud cry which he made, the good man awoke, and took him by the hand, asking him what he ailed. Sir, said he, I felt such pain in my sleep that I was almost dead. So it seemed by your cry, said the old man, but it is time to set out. Then he got upon his ass. Amadis would have walked by him, but the good man, with great entreaty, made him mount his horse, and so they fared on together. As they went, Amadis besought him to grant one boon, which should be no ways hurtful, the which the old man granted. I pray you then, said Amadis, that so long as we are together you will not tell any man who I am, nor anything concerning me, and that you will call me by some other name, not my own. And when I am dead you tell my brethren of me, that they may take my body into their country. Your life and death, said the good man, are in the hands of God, so talk no more of this. He will help you, if you know and love and serve him as you ought. But tell me, by what name will you be called? Even by whatever it shall please you. So the old man, seeing how fair he was, and in how forlorn a condition, replied, I will give you a name conformable to your appearance and distress. Beltenebros. Now Beltenebros being interpreted signifieth the fair forlorn. The name pleased Amadis, and he admired the good sense of the old man in choosing it. So by this name he was long known till it became as renowned as that of Amadis. Thus communing, they reached the seaside just as the night closed in. There they found a bark, wherein the good man might cross to his hermitage. Beltenebros gave his horse to the mariners, and they gave him in exchange a cloak of goat-skin and a garment of coarse gray woolen. They embarked, and Beltenebros asked the good man what was his own name and the name of his abode. They call my dwelling-place, said he, the poor rock, because none can live there without enduring great poverty. My own name is Andolod. I was a clerk of some learning, and spent my youth in many vanities, till it pleased God to awaken me, and then I withdrew to this solitary abode. For thirty years I have never left it, till now that I went to the burial of my sister. At length... They reached the rock and landed, and the mariners returned to the mainland. Thus Amadis, now called Beltenebros, remained on the poor rock, partaking the austerities of the hermit, not for devotion, but for despair, forgetful of his great renown in arms, and hoping and expecting death, all for the anger of a woman." When Gandalin awoke in the mountain, he looked round him, and seeing only his own horse, started up, misdoubting what had happened. He called aloud, and searched among the shrubs in vain. He could find neither Amadis nor his horse. Then, knowing Amadis was departed, he turned to his horse to ride after him, but the saddle and bridle were gone. Upon that he cursed himself and his evil fortune." and the day wherein he was born, going from one place to another, till at length he espied the harness and immediately set out on pursuit. Five days he rode on, sleeping in desert places, inquiring at every habitation for his master. On the sixth chance led him to the fountain where Amadis had left his armor. Here he beheld a tent in which were two damsels, 
he alighted and asked them if they had seen a knight who bore two lions azure in a golden field they answered that they had not seen him but such a shield and the whole harness of a knight they had found beside that fountain when gandalin heard this he tore his hair and exclaimed holy mary help me my master the best knight in the world is dead or lost how badly have i served you my lord and now with reason ought i to be hated by all men and the earth ought not to suffer me upon her since i have left you at such a time you were he who succored all and now all have forsaken you the world and all in it have abandoned you and i caitiff wretch and more wretched than all that ever were born have left you in your death and with that for excess of passion he fell down the damsels shrieked out holy mary help the squire is dead and they ran to him and flung water in his face but it was long before they could recall him to his senses good squire they cried be not desperate for a thing which is not certain you had better seek him till you learn whether he be alive or dead good men ought to bear up against sorrow not to die in despair gandalin took heart at their words and resolved to seek his master as long as he lived ladies said he where did you see these arms we will tell you willingly we were in the company of don guilan the pensive who delivered us and twenty other knights and damsels from the prison of gandinos the ruffian behaving himself there so valiantly that he hath destroyed the wicked customs of the castle and constrained the lord thereof to swear never more to maintain the same we came with guilan to this fountain four days ago and when he saw the shield for which you inquired he was very sorrowful and alighting said the shield of the best knight in the world should not lie thus and with that weeping sorely he hung the shield upon this tree and bade us keep it while he rode to seek him whose it was we set up our tents here and guilan sought for him three days without success yesterday he returned and this morning giving his own arms to his squires he girded on the sword and took the shield saying by god shield thou makest a bad exchange in losing thy master to go with me he told us he would carry the arms to queen brisena we also and all who were delivered by him are going to that court to beg the queen of her goodness to recompense don guilan as the knights will beseech the king then god be with you quoth gandalin i shall take your advice and as most caitiff and unhappy wretch in the world go seek for him upon whom my life or death depends end of chapter six chapter seven how durin returned to his lady after having delivered her bidding to amadis and of the grief she made for the news on the tenth day after he had left amadis in the forest durin reached london and alighting at his own lodging went straight to the queen's palace so soon as oriana saw him her heart throbbed violently so that she could not calm it and she went into her chamber and lay down upon the bed bidding the damsel of denmark go for her brother and bring him to her secretly the damsel returned with durin and leaving him with her mistress went out to mabilia now friend said oriana tell me where you have been and where you found amadis and what he did when he read my letter and if you have seen queen briolania tell me everything then durin related how he had followed amadis from sobradisa to the firm island and arrived there just as amadis was passing under the arch of true lovers under the which none might pass that had been false to his first love how cried she dared he prove that adventure knowing that he could not accomplish it it did not turn out so replied the squire he accomplished it with more loyalty than any other had ever there displayed and was received with more honour 
and such signs as had never been seen before. When Oriana heard this, her joy was very great, that that which had occasioned her great anger was thus disproved. He proceeded with his tale how Amadis had won the forbidden chamber. Hold, quoth she, and she lifted up her hands and began to pray God that she might one day be in that chamber with him who had worthily won it. Now, quoth she, tell me, what did Amadis when you gave him the letter? The tears came into Durin's eyes. Lady, I advise you not to ask, for you have done the worst cruelty and devilry that ever damsel committed. Holy Mary, cried Oriana, what art thou saying? I say, repeated Durin, that you have unjustly destroyed the best and truest knight that ever woman had, or will have to the end of the world. Cursed be the hour in which such a thing was devised, and cursed be death that did not take me before I carried such a message. If I had known what I carried, I would rather have slain myself than have appeared before him, for you, in sending that letter, and I, in taking it, have been the cause of his death. Then he related everything that had passed, and all that Amadis had said, and how he was gone into the mountain to die. While he was relating these things, all Oriana's anger was gone, and her shame and anguish became so intolerable that when he had ceased she could not utter a word, but remained like one who had lost her senses. Durin, albeit that he thought she well deserved this suffering, was yet moved to pity, and he went to Mabilia and his sister, and said to them, Go and help Oriana, for if she hath done wrong, her punishment is come upon her, and he went his way. They ran to her, and, seeing in what state she was, they fastened the door of her chamber, and threw water in her face, and brought her to herself, and she then began to lament what she had done, and cry out for death. But those true friends sent again for Durin, and learnt from him all that had passed, and then began to comfort her, and they made her write a letter to request his forgiveness, and bid him come with all speed to the castle of Miraflores, there to receive her atonement. This letter the damsel of Denmark would take and search for him, for she refused no trouble or difficulty for the two persons in the world whom she loved best, and because Amadis in his sorrow had talked so much of Gandales, they thought he might be with him, and they agreed, as a pretext for her going there, that she should carry gifts to the Queen of Scotland, and tidings of her daughter Mabilia. Oriana, therefore, told her mother they were about to send the damsel, and Brisena, approving thereof, sent also presents from herself. This being settled, the damsel, in company with her brother Durin and Enil, a nephew of Gandales, rode to a port called Vigil, which is in that part of Great Britain towards Scotland, and embarking there, in seven days they came to the town called Pologies in Scotland. From thence they proceeded to the castle of Gandales. Him they met going to the chase, and saluted him, and he, perceiving that the damsel was of a foreign land by her speech, asked her from whence she came. "'I am the messenger,' quoth she, "'of some damsels whom you love much, "'and who have sent gifts to the Queen of Scotland.' "'Good damsel, and who are they?' "'Oriana, daughter of King Lisuarte and Mabilia, "'whom you know.' "'Then Gandales joyfully bade them welcome "'and took them to his castle. "'As they were conversing, the old knight inquired for his foster son Amadis. At this the damsel was grieved, perceiving that he was not there as they had hoped, but not to distress Gandales by the truth, she only answered that he was not yet returned from Sobradisa. We thought, said she, that he would first accompany his cousin Agrayes here to see you and the queen his aunt, and I bring letters to him from Queen Brisena and his other friends, which he would be right glad to receive. This she said. 
that if Amadis were there in secret, he might be induced to see her. She remained with Gandales two days, then proceeded to the queen. End of chapter 7 Recording by James K. White Chula Vista